Have you ever found yourself in the middle of having the rug pulled out from under your feet? Where you're just in this moment where you're just lost and confused. You've gone from uh, experiencing just the high of a situation and the joy, uh, feeling like everything's working, that you've achieved victory or accomplished something, going to this moment where everything's just fallen apart and you don't know what's happened and you're just looking around confused. Like, how did we get here? I've experienced that many times in my life, but one time it just stands out to me. It happened back in 2012. It was a September. It was a Sunday morning, and me and my friends, two of my friends, we were in Seattle. We were going to Questfield. We were going to watch a football game, the Seattle Seahawks play a game. It was early in the season. It was week three, and this was a season where there was just this feeling of excitement. Everybody was ready. The Seahawks looked like they were about to, to take the next step they might be a Super Bowl contender. And this game was kind of going to set the tone for the rest of the season. They were playing the Green Bay Packers and they were up against uh, uh, the Aaron Rodgers led offense, a guy who at this point is considered one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time. And this was the test. Are they actually going to have arrived? And as we, as we get to the game, there's just this excitement going on, this buzz in the air. And we sit down to watch the first, the first half and, and, and it completely lives up to our expectations. It is just this amazing, amazing game. I love football for a lot of reasons, but the main reason is I love the defense. And this game is just a, a show of defense. In the first half alone, the Seahawks sack Aaron Rodgers eight times. And if that doesn't mean much to you, eight sacks in a game for both teams is considered a lot. And here they are by themselves, eight sacks the first half. It's just this complete defensive showing, but it's also a struggle. Their offense just can't get going until right before the first half, Seattle finally drives down the field. They score a touchdown. There's excitement in the air. And the first half ends up seven to nothing. And everybody's just, just jacked. We're just pumped. We're, we're excited for the second half. We feel like, hey, this is it. We finally arrived. The Seahawks are going to now come out in the second half and just steamroll the Packers. It's going to be beautiful. And then the second half shows up. And it's not this steamrolling. It's not this, this parade, this victory parade. Instead, it's this slow descent. They can't put in the offense together and their defense still does well, but there's no more sacks to be found. And, and there's a field goal for Green Bay here and a field goal there. And finally, with four minutes left in the game, the Green Bay marches down the field and they score a, a touchdown. The defense holds out on two-point conversion, but they're down 12 to seven and, and the entire stadium just deflates. And if you've ever been there, this is one of the loudest places on earth during the middle of the game. And now it's just almost completely silent. Everybody's just done. They're defeated. What was assured victory now looks like, hey, we're just going to, we're about to lose this game. And Seattle gets the ball back with four minutes left. They drive down the field, but it comes up short. They have to give Green Bay back the ball. There's two minutes left and everybody's just, we've seen this before, right? We've watched, we're Seattle sports fans. We watched the team succeed only to fall flat on their face. And here they are again, just not good enough. The defense holds out and, and Seattle gets the ball back. Green Bay punts it and they get it back on the Green Bay 46 yard line with 46 seconds left. And everybody's like, right, there's, there's a sliver of hope, but everybody knows what's going to happen. We're never going to get over the hump. And Seattle gets the ball two plays later. They get to the 24 yard line. There's 24 seconds left. And, and we're just a little bit more excitement building. And three plays in a row, Russell Wilson drops back. Three plays in a row, he throws the ball. And three plays in a row, the ball hits the turf incomplete. Complete deflation. We were deflated before, and now there's nothing left. It's fourth down. There's six seconds left. Everybody's like, yeah, we really just want to get out and leave the stadium, but we're not going to walk out. There's one play left. And, and, and there's only one type of play that can be left in the game. It's a Hail Mary. And if you're not familiar with the term, it's a pass that, that is just a prayer. It is one of the least successful plays in all of sports. Uh, something like 92% of all Hail Marys fall uh, to the ground unsuccessful. And so six seconds left, Russell Wilson drops back. He throws the ball in what for us is the farthest corner of the end zone where the complete other side. We watch the ball go up. Golden Tate jumps up. There's all these defenders around him. There's wrestling in the air. There's wrestling on the ground. And everybody just pauses, staring at the one spot in the game. And for us, 
right? I've watched the game now years later, and this happens over a couple seconds for us. It feels like an hour. We're just standing there, breath held, watching, and finally the ref's arms go up. It's victory. There's this massive party. We're going nuts. I'm high-fiving my buddies and people around me. I'm hugging my friends, hugging people I've never met and will never see ever again in my life. Complete pandemonium. It was this amazing moment. And in that three and a half, four hours, we had gone and experienced this roller coaster of emotions from, from what felt like assured victory to, to absolute defeat. And then at the last second, this last second win. And I share that story because I, I want us to put us in the place of where the disciples are on Easter Sunday. They've gone through this complete roller coaster of emotion. They've gone from the triumphal entry this moment where, they, where Jesus has arrived as their Messiah, their Savior. He's gonna, gonna free them from the Romans like Moses did from the Egyptians. They're pumped. There's this coronation ceremony where they think their king has arrived. And then Friday comes. And the king who was to free them is now dead on a cross. They've gone from assured victory now to complete defeat and so the Easter, the Easter story for us is one of joy, a celebration, and we know the whole picture, but for them in the moment, right in the middle of it, it feels like everything has fallen apart. What they thought they were going to get now is nowhere to be found. And so when we, when we view it like that, we're, what we're gonna see in Luke 24, the confusion and all the, the feelings, the emotions are completely understandable. They don't have the whole picture. They don't understand that Jesus is risen from the dead. They haven't seen Jesus arrive and snatch the, uh, victory from the jaws of the feet. And that's what we're going to see today. To set up Luke 24, right before it, what has happened is Jesus has been placed in the tomb and the disciples, in particular, the, the women, the, the group of women, the followers of Jesus, they've watched Jesus be placed in the tomb and they've decided now that they're going to return home. They're going to prepare spices so that they can return to give Jesus a proper burial. Luke 24, verse one says, but on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. So those very same women who on Friday had watched Jesus be laid in the tomb, now Sunday morning on the third day, returned to the tomb uh, to, to finish, finish the proper burial for Jesus. And what's really interesting about this in other gospel accounts is that this is just an act of faith and love. They even themselves wonder, how are we gonna actually do this? They've seen the massive stone that is now rolled in front of the tomb, a, a stone that they themselves are not gonna be able to move. They're aware that it's guarded by Roman centurions, these, these men who are, they're not gonna talk their way past and yet they, they act out of faith. They act out of love. They're ready to go honor Jesus uh, by performing this action. And yet what they find, they're not prepared for. It says on verse two, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Here they come to this, this tomb with this massive stone in front of it. And as they're walking up, they see this, the stone has now been moved. It's no longer guarded by the Romans that someone could go in and out freely. And this is, a, this is actually evidence that Jesus has left behind for them. They don't understand what's going on, but what we understand about Jesus, what we'll see later in the story is he doesn't need to move the stone. If he wants to, he can just pass right through it. But the stone is moved so that as they arrive, they now can gather the evidence. They can piece together what has happened to their king. The stone is rolled away where before what they expected was they were going to come. The stone was there and they were going to have to leave. Now they can venture inside. And when they go inside, Jesus is nowhere to be found. There's nobody. And then they start wondering. It says, while they were perplexed about this, behold, Two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And this, this word dazzling apparel is the point that these aren't men, these aren't humans, these are angels of God. It says, and as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Right, the angels are telling these, these disciples, this group of women that, why are you even here? 
And they're not, they're not mocking them or questioning them in that way. They're pointing to the truth of what has happened. Why have you come with spices and perfumes to, to, to finish burying this body, right? There's nobody living in this tomb, right? Jesus is up. He's risen. He's alive. This tomb is for the dead. He's gone. And finally, it starts to click with this group of disciples. They're excited. They, they're still questioning what's going on. And it says, remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. The angels continue to point out, right? This is what you should have expected. Jesus has been talking about this. All of scripture has been pointing to this. Jesus was supposed to die, but the Messiah in his death, he would rise on the third day. This is what should be expected. This is what Jesus was preparing you for. His words have come true. He is risen where once he is dead, now he has life. And verse eight says, and they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11 and to all the rest. These, this group of women, these disciples, they return now to uh, who would be the more famous disciples, the, the ones who would become the apostles, and they start telling what they have found. It says, now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told, them, who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. This group of women take back what they have found to the men, and, and they're not believed. This word idle tales in the Greek just paints this picture of like crazed, deranged women believing this fanciful tale that they've created in their mind. And this is just a really cool picture of Jesus as he did throughout his ministry, elevating women. Nobody would choose in this culture to have women be the first to discover him because women would have been always to assume that this is how they are. They're just too emotional. They don't know what's going on. They're not intelligent like men. In fact, their testimony in, in court wouldn't even be accepted. That's exactly what they find happened. The disciples hear it and they just, they brush it off. They just, they're just, they're overly emotional and they're creating this story in their mind. They still don't believe the truth that has happened. But interestingly enough, verse 12, but Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen clothes by themselves and he went home marveling at what had happened. Peter goes to the tomb and he goes inside. And of course, Jesus is not found there, but he finds the, the linen that would have wrapped his body he finds it left behind. And in one of the other gospels, I believe it's John, he talks about finding uh, not just the linen that would wrap his body, but also the, the, the cloth that would be around his face set to the side, folded up nice and neat. Again, evidence that Jesus has left behind. His body is no longer there. If robbers were to come in and take the body, they wouldn't take the time to unwrap Jesus. They're not gonna take this now decaying, rotten, nasty body out of all the wrapping. They're not gonna take and fold up the linen nice and neat and set it to the side. They're gonna grab the body and go. But Jesus isn't in a hurry. He's risen just as he expected. And he removes his his his. The, the, the wrapping around him, he sets to the side and he leaves the tomb. And that's the evidence now that, that Peter has found that Jesus, his king, has indeed risen from the dead. And while these, this group of his closest disciples are wrestling with what's going on, there's actually a scene break. We, we move to another part of the, uh, we see other of the lesser known disciples wrestling with what is going on, wrestling with having seen their king arrive to Jerusalem only to have died on a cross. And we find uh, how they too discover that Jesus is in fact not dead, but alive. It says that very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Here comes Jesus. He finds two of his disciples, maybe men that he's had conversation with, that he knows from previous. They certainly know him. And he just comes up besides them and is listening to them. And he said to them, he asked them a question that is interesting because he already knows the answer. What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. 
Jesus starts now asking probing questions. Where is their heart? Where is their mind? What's going on? What, what, are, you, what are you discussing really to point them eventually to the truth? Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? Now, this has to be Jesus because he does what he always does through his ministry. He's asked the question and he doesn't answer it directly. He just asks the question back. And he does this all the time, right? Because he wants to really know what's going on in their hearts and their mind. Where does their loyalty lie? Where are they, what are they believing? And they said to him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet mighty indeed in word before God and all the people and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and beside all of this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. They start telling Jesus everything that's been going on in the last three days, everything that they're wrestling with their hearts. And it's very, it's, it's so cool what they're revealing, right? In the midst of it, they reveal who they believe Jesus to be. They thought he wasn't just a prophet. He was the Messiah. And now that, that they seem like everything has, that they've, they've hoped for, what they believe Jesus to be is no longer true. They're wrestling. Uh, they're just wrestling with what, what is going on. And now what is going on? The tomb is empty, and Jesus hears all this, and he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Jesus hears where they're wrestling, and he just, he, he points to this is what was always supposed to happen. It was the words he himself multiple times to tell his disciples that he was going to, that he was going to die only to rise on the third day. All of scripture was pointing to it. And we don't know exactly what Jesus says to them, but he's revealing them to the truth that all of the Old Testament, all of the law and the prophets and the Psalms, they were always pointing to this moment. They were always revealing what was going to happen and who Jesus was. And I love this list David Guzik has put together, kind of speculating, what is he telling them? Who is he revealing himself to be? Was he telling him that he is the seed of the woman, Eve, whose heel was bruised, that he was the blessing of Abraham to all nations, that he was the high priest after the order of Melchizedek, that he was the man who wrestled with Jacob, that he was the lion of the tribe of Judah, that he was the voice from the burning bush, that he was the Passover lamb, that he was the prophet greater than Moses, that he was the captain of the Lord's army to Joshua, that he was the ultimate kinsman redeemer mentioned in Ruth, that he was the son of David, who was a king greater than David, that he was the suffering son Savior of Psalm 22 and the Good Shepherd of Psalm 23, that he was the Savior described in the prophets and the suffering servant of Isaiah 53, that he and he alone was the princely Messiah of Daniel who would establish a kingdom that would never end. Whatever he said, whatever the specifics were, he just points to them that he was the fulfillment of all the Old Testament scripture, that he had arrived, that he had fulfilled all the prophecy, which included him dying and rising on the third day. And here he was standing in front of them, except he doesn't reveal that, reveal that last part to them just yet. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going <clears throat> farther, but they urged him strongly saying, stay with us for it is toward evening and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broken and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized them and he vanished from their sight. Finally, after revealing everything, after hearing what they're wrestling with, he sits down with them. And as they're talking, he finally opens their eyes and they see the truth, the truth that is right in front of them, that Jesus is no longer dead. He is alive. He's, he's talking with them. 
and then he vanishes. He disappears on them and they're left wondering what to do. Uh, but he does this, right? Because he wants now, he doesn't want to just stay with them. He doesn't want them to just focus on him. He wants them to take this message and spread the news, spread the good news that Jesus has risen. And they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while we talked to us? Excuse me, he talked to us on the road while he opened to us the scriptures they have the realization that, 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 that everything that was going on inside them as he's talking to them was revealing the absolute truth to them, that they were witnessing the risen Messiah and, and, and something was welling up within them and now, now they're gonna go share it. It says, and they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. They've just walked seven miles to Emmaus. Now they're gonna get up. They're going seven miles back. They're not gonna hesitate. Nothing's gonna keep them from sharing the good news. And they found the 11 and those who were with them gathered together saying, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. This, I, I just have, can't imagine what it was like in this, this, this room, all of them together sharing what they have discovered, starting to piece together that Jesus is actually risen from the dead. And it says, as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood amongst them and said to them, peace to you. In, in several of the other gospels, it's, it's specifically mentioned that the doors to the house are closed. So it's not Jesus just showing up. He doesn't just stroll in, walk in. He just appears next to them. Could you imagine Jesus just showing up and saying, peace to you? And so you can understand verse 37, but they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Jesus gives them more evidence, right? This is not some random guy off the street posing as Jesus. He shows them their hands and their feet. He shows them the evidence that he is the same guy who, who three days prior was up on the cross, nailed to a cross, spikes driven through his hands and his feet, and he shows them the holes that would exist. There's, there's just overwhelming evidence in it right in front of them that he is, in fact, the risen king. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it before them. I don't know exactly why this part is mentioned in the story. Maybe Jesus is just really famished. I mean, rising from the dead is probably a lot of hard work. Uh, but maybe it just, it just points to just the, the reality of the situation, just this extra, uh, for us, this extra little evidence that points to uh, the truth. Why would they include it? I don't know. Let's move on. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opens their <clears throat> excuse me, opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it was written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sin, sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. And Jesus, once again, just as he had done to the men on the road, just as the angels had done to the women at the tomb, reminds them that this is what always had to happen, that he himself had, had told them time and again that he was going to die and so that he could rise again. And it was necessary. It was necessary. His death on the cross, the blood that was spilt was the necessary sacrifice required to pay for our sins. It was the wages that he, or that we had earned that he would take on himself and that it was required that on the third day that he would rise again, that he would defeat death, he would defeat sin. And through that, you and I and all who believe could have salvation through his works. And then he calls them, right? He calls them now to carry forth his mission into the world. Now that you have seen the truth, that you have witnessed my resurrection, now that you have forgiveness, you're to take this and proclaim it to all the nations. You're to declare to them the forgiveness that is offered through the death and resurrection of Christ. And he, 
he, he's going to leave them with something. He says, you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Shortly after this, Jesus will ascend to heaven, but he tells them he is leaving, but something greater is coming, that he's not leaving them alone, that the Father has promised them a gift, the Holy Spirit who will indwell each and every believer, and it's through him that they will continue to experience transformation. Through the Holy Spirit, they will be able to go to the nations to carry out, to be witnesses of Jesus and what he offers. And it's the same gift he loves each and every one of us with the promised Holy Spirit that indwells each and every one of us as believers that we too can now take the truth, the truth of our resurrected King and we can share it with our neighbors, with our community, with the, all the nations of the world. Jesus, Jesus died for us on the cross for our sins, but he, he defeated death. He defeated that sin. He defeated Satan and through him, the resurrected King, we have eternal life. Thank you so much for joining us for this Easter celebration. I love you and have a great day.